So I would like to ask uh, our panel to come here and our chair, Peter Eckersall. So please take a seat. And we're going to get some microphones, not only um, so you all hear better, but we're also uh, live streaming it and recording it. and. Uh, it might be the first live streamed uh, showing of that, uh, of that piece. So again, thank you all um, for coming, and I hand over to our chair of the panel, Peter. Thank you, thank you, and, and thank you everyone for, um, I think it was quite remarkable to see those films, and uh, um, thank you also for your wonderful performance, thank you so much. Um, my name is Peter Eckersold, and I'm a professor in the Graduate Centre here in the PhD program in theatre, and uh, uh, my work on Japan is in theatre, so I come to Tiri Yamashuji through the theatre, uh, but of course I've seen many of the films, but I'm very fortunate to have seen these, uh, these films tonight. And we do have, I think, a really interesting panel to have, I hope, uh, a quite an interesting but unfortunately quite brief discussion tonight because we have to finish at a certain time. But just very briefly, if I can introduce the panel, I'm starting from the far left. Um, we have uh, Tom Lucer from uh, New York University. Tom's a uh, professor of, uh, works in a program in Asian studies, specializes in uh, Japanese contemporary performance, media, and culture. Um, so we welcome Tom. Uh, second, um, Chizuru Usui from the National Film Center. Uh, and you brought those wonderful prints to us today. Thank you very much. And I do agree that the restorations are quite remarkable. The colors are quite extraordinary. Um, uh, on my left is uh, Henriku Teriyama. A uh, round of applause for our performer, please. Um, <laughs> Henry Koo is an artist, performer, graphic designer and writer. At the age of 17, he left his family home and joined uh, Teriyama Suji's uh, uh, theatre company, Tenjo Sajiki. Uh, I think he's very well known to us who have some familiarity with the company whether it's in uh, theatre or films or some of the spectacular images that we can see in books and so on. A central figure in the 1960s, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, he's acted, he joined the troupe as an actor, a stage manager, sound designer, and eventually became an assistant director for Taniyama's film productions. He's also an editor and an art director for the photo books by uh, Nobuyoshi Araki. So quite a remarkable career. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, just on my right, um, Julia, I'll have to pronounce Alex Zuvia. Uh, how did I do? Um, as she's a film scholar from CUNY Brooklyn, so fellow uh, colleague from City University of New York, and she works on Teriyama's films. And then uh, further to my right is uh, Alex Zaltan, who's a film scholar from Harvard University and works on films in 1960s Japan with a particular interest in Teriyama's films. And uh, Alex, of course, has been at the Harvard event for this uh, performance as well. So uh, we thank him for coming down to New York and really great to have you on the panel tonight. And you know Frank on the end of uh, uh, the chairs there. Um, perhaps if I could just begin, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the work of Ter uh, Teriyama Shuji, the director of these films. but. Uh, Teriyama was a major figure in the 1960s avant-garde of Japan, uh, a key figure in the J Japanese theatre, so-called Angora theatre scene of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, his company produced many great theatre works, and he was a playwright, director, filmmaker, uh, experimental television producer. He made uh, plays for radio. 
He wrote songs uh, for Enka, and he was an award-winning poet as well. So he truly is one of the great, uh, most important figures in 1960s or perhaps in 20th century Japanese uh, film, uh, theatre and literature. And a, a truly interdisciplinary artist, I think, who was uh, equally interesting in all the forms. Um, as a maker, as you can see, gather from some of the work we've seen tonight, he has some fascinations for certain things. I think he obviously has this very strong fascination for uh, uh, a, a kind of um, mixing of the everyday with, uh, you know, the everyday world with fictional realities, moving between the everyday and the fictional and blurring the distinctions between them. Uh, he famously made theatre works where audiences would enter the theatre from different uh, entrances and experience a different theatrical experience as a result. Uh, in 1975, he made his perhaps most one of his most famous works, Knock, uh, which was a two-day performance event that took place uh, in many venues across Tokyo. And one, uh, one's ticket was a map for all the performances that took place uh, in parks, gardens, houses, um, factories, theatres, and perhaps most notoriously, a bathhouse. And uh, <coughs> one entered the bathhouse uh, not knowing who was the audience and who were the performers and who were simply just people there expecting to have a regular bath, So, um, which is quite a, quite a well-known piece. Uh, I think from my interest, I, I, I wrote about Teddy Armour in my first book on the 60s avant-garde, <coughs> and I saw him as one of the most primary thinkers of a tradition in Japan on the avant-garde, uh, particularly with his ideas about the radical imagination, uh, the way that he could think through uh, very... Uh, uh, his, his cultural vision was, I think, quite extraordinary, um, turning to the grotesque, the vaudeville, to classical Japanese ghost figures, uh, really bringing together an extraordinary array of influences into his very powerful work. And his company was well known for making extraordinary performances that often involved the audience, if not literally in an audience participation like we just saw, certainly in some kind of uh, repetitious sonic disturbance, some kind of pro provocation for the audience to endure. Uh, hammers are a frequent uh, feature of his work and he would often use them in the theatre percussively to, you know, according to people who were there, really to annoy them with the sound that just uh, would continue for a very long time. And there were many other tropes that we can uh, see in his work, uh, the grotesque, the, the, the carnival, um, the focus on uh, you know, a kind of um, fascination for fetish objects, and so on and so forth. So I, I won't continue tonight, but I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak briefly about um, their res Well, first of all, I think I'll ask Heinrichu to talk about uh, his experience of both participating in this film and then reviving it now for re-performing it and reimagining it in the current era. Uh, and then I'll ask each of the panelists to briefly respond to the films that they saw tonight and then we'll take questions from the audience. So um, first of all, um, Heinrichu, if I could ask you to speak just a little bit about uh, uh, your experience of, I guess, working with Teriyama working in this film and both uh, what you were doing back then and, and how you think about reviving this film now for a kind of uh, uh, retrospective performance uh, in, in a very different uh, time and place. とても難しい質問なんですけども。<coughs> 1965年まで僕はテレアマと17年間ずっと一緒に仕事してそれで最初は役者志望だったんだけどもヘンリクはトゥーマッチ目立ちすぎるから役者は向いてないって言われて音響のスタッフになって次にステージマネージャーやったり
So I was helping him with sound design. で、サウンドデザイナーやりながら、えっ、ー、と、劇団のいろんなデザインの仕事も手伝ってました。で、日常生活もそうなんですけども、えー、ずっとほとんど寺山と一緒に生活していました。I was also helping out with the art design, and in addition, I was living with him the whole time as well. えー、時代が、えー、それからちょうど30年ちょっと経ったわけなんですけどもすごく変わったと僕は思います毎朝寺山さんに電話で呼び出されて、えー、喫茶店に行くわけです喫茶店で寺山さんは原稿を書いています毎朝台本要するに芝居の台本なんですけども、えー、当時コピーというものがありませんでした。ですからあの原稿用紙テレマさんと同じ原稿用紙をもらってテレマさんの原稿用紙を一時ずっと書き写すわけです。So、I would just endlessly be copying his scripts by hand. で、役者さんの数だけ書かなきゃいけないので、3枚とか10枚とか同じことを書いてました。ですからあの最後はもうテレマさんとそっくりの字になってしまいました。So、end, だから今もコピーもあるし、携帯電話もあるしで、だからコミュニケーションというふうなもののなんていうかな、速さがすごく違ってきていると思います。Nowadays we have Xerox machines and phones, and I think the speed of communication has increased so much since then. だからコミュニケーションが早い方がいいとはあんまり今見てて思わないんですけどもやっぱりなんかあのコミュニケーションの節度っていうふうなものをみんなそれぞれ考えてほしいと思います。そういうふうなものをみんなそれぞれ考えてほしいと思います。今だから映画って言ってこういうふうに16ミリの映写機回す映画なんて、えー、ほとんどの人が知らないし映画学科の人でさえフィルムの編集もできません。Uh, だからビデオで何でもできるようになったんだけども何でもできることがいいことだとは思わないというのは。想像力がだんだんだんだん欠けていくような気がします。So videos, sure、今日はあの彼が16ミリの音も聞か、要するに機械の音も聞かせたいと言って、こういうふうにセッティングしてくれたんですけども、とてもありがたいことだと思います。ありがとうございます。So、today I'm very glad and thankful that Frank suggested that we have the 16mm for the sound of it as well. I'm very thankful. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, perhaps if I could ask Tom just to make、uh, a few comments and we'll just go along the line a little bit. Yeah? Sure, just. Yeah. We have、um, some time, we don't feel rushed so much. <laughs> okay, much. Well, I, I, I'll, 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 I can talk through it.、Um, I think I'll just talk about the first and the third because、um, the second one I think is more straightforward, although I really like it.、Um, and I wanted to say a couple comments about what seems to be the anarchism of the sign that he's playing with, or the kind of radicality that Tariyama was playing with.、Um, and the first one, I mean the third one, I'll start with the third one, the ones about the nails. The nails themselves seem to be reduced, you can make a story out of it. But they seem to be reduced to a kind of brute materiality of qualities, maybe, and of actions. So that you can see it, a nail could also be a phallus. It could be just a weight. Somebody has to, a load that you have to bear, in other words. It could be a set of acts that involve penetration, et cetera. They seem to work through the film, and that they exceed the screen itself. So it's a kind of materiality that is immaterial, but it's also physical,、um, that you can participate in, you almost have to participate in, and then 
question is what kind of materiality is it that you are when you're nailing a, hand, a, a nail into the wall there, what are you participating in? It's unclear, right? So there's a kind of radical uncertainty that attaches to the sign of the nail, or the nail as a sign, that you only can figure out by deciding for yourself. That quality of having to decide for yourself is part of the anarchism. It, the, a, typically a nail would be used, for instance, to build a structure. The question then becomes, well, what kind of structure of meaning are you using those nails, or are you participating in when you're hammering those nails into that screen slash wall? It's really unclear. That could be a problem, maybe not. I think it's, a, it, it's an interesting sort of, of, of radicality at that point that seems to be more, more visible and perhaps more pessimistic in the first one, the, the documentary. And in that documentary, in some ways, in the very first scene with the father and the son, you can see the kind of imposition of political meaning that the, the father is attaching to the son. The son is almost incomprehending of the questions. He has no idea how to answer them or even necessarily what the questions are. But the father is essentially telling this, the kid how to respond. And apparently, politically appropriate responses like Cassius Clay, great guy, um, or something like that. But again, you can see, even at the level of clear politics, that's not real politics at all. That's simply the imposition of meaning. And after that, basically, the film seems to devolve into a set of randomized questions that reduce the questions' difference themselves to something like digital information, where you just say, what you had for breakfast is the same thing as answering whether you like your friends or your country better. And so then the only way you can say that series of documentary questions would add up to something would again, sort of like the nails in the structure, be a structure that you would have to impose. But in this case, it almost seems to resist that. There's no way for me that I could come away from that documentary saying, this is what Tedayama wants you to see about America. This is what all those questions add up to, in which case, it's actually really kind of nihilistic. It's kind of empty of any meaning at all. And so that seems to be one potential carry through of precisely the radical anarchistic qualities of the Teriyama sign, that ultimately there is no sociality, there is no commonality, there is no meaning that becomes a kind of negativity. So some of the radicality seems to be this tension between a really productive openness and an absolutely emptiness of, of, of the sign itself. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back to many of these questions in our discussion, so if it will, we'll move along the, the, um, our circle for now. Um, uh, Suisan, could you speak a little bit about uh, um, your interest in Teriyama and also, I, I guess, because you're also representing the National Film Archive, and um, uh, obviously Teriyama's status as a filmmaker is extremely important in Japan. Perhaps you could say something about that as well. えっと、あの、あの、寺山修司の作品がどうやってフィルム上で再現されるのかということを、ま、勉強してきたわけなんですけれども、その中で、あの、ものすごいその時系画の監督ってもちろんマテリアルにすごく向かっていくですが、寺山監督が本当に
あの、まあ、今回その復元でフィルムセンターがものすごくあの頑張ったなとあの自負しているのはあのフィルムセンターのようなフィルムアーカイブにおいて復元をする、まあ、あの再度プリントを焼くという時にどれだけオリジナルに近づけるかという,かというのがあのとても重要なポイントです。Uh, so, I'm going to speak a little bit about the technical aspects. So, one of the things that the archives is very careful about, usually, one tries to、uh, make the original as close to the,、uh, make the restoration as close to the original in terms of color as possible. その中で、あのまあ、テラム修士監督が実際にそのプリントを焼いていた時代と現代では、いわゆるフィルムを焼く機械というものが、方法が全然違うんですね。The printing machines that Mr. Tayama would have had are completely different to the ones that we have today. And the Konkai no Anofkuge Noite wa, ano, just a kyo wa joy ganakata saki nan is kedo mo, ano, tatoeba, sono, e to reference to dekir yo na, Terayama Shuji Kanto ga, mada gozon me chun ni, ano, yai te il print to yo no, mazu watas ta chiwa sono yon no kihon ni shimashita. We used a film which was not screened today that he had printed at the time as a reference、uh, to base our、uh, color off of. And we also contacted the technicians that he worked with at the time, if possible, to ask and confirm if they were the right colors. So, in the case of 昔の,そのプリンターの色を再現するということでももちろんかなり苦労したんですけれども同時にその昔のプリンターの、えー、とある種その可能な領域の幅をかなり広く使ってこの寺山修司監督というのは作品を作っていたなというのが、まあ、復元を通して分かりました。Uh, so, in addition to、um, being as loyal to the original as possible, we were able to find out that Mr. Terama used a very wide,、uh, he really broadened the spectrum of color possible in, in the printing process at the time. さっきあのこの旅の間ヘンリクさんと話したらあの実はそうでもなかったのかもしれないというかあのかなりカメラマンの方があのすごいそこは頑張って、まあ、それに対して寺山さんがあそうなんだそうだねっていう感じでやっていたのかなというのが分かりました。Uh, so, I was initially very moved in the, in the lab to discover this, but as I came here to America this time and I was speaking to Mr. ヘンリク I realized, or Mr. Heniku pointed out to me that that might not have been the case, and it might have just been a choice of the, the cameraman. I know, now the Choto Konato Mata Anthology Film Archives, no, the Mo, Joy Garno, the Zehi, Hokano Tampen Sakimo, Mitita Daketara Tomon Deskeramo, Ano Tojo, Iro, Saigen Sir Tamini, Toba Shirokuro, no High Contrast, no, Nega o Scate, Satsay Sarate Mono, Ano Karani, Yakutokini, さまざまなフィルターを使ってさらにその明るさがなくなってしまうのをあのきちっと適切なものにするために今度はボルトを上げてというようなあの数多くのテストをした上でのニュープリントを今回持ってきていますのでぜひあのたくさん見ていただけたらなと思います。Uh, making sure the black and white high contrast、um, and the colors are very loyal to the original. So I, I hope you can see that. Thank you so much. And I appreciate this very, very technical discussion alongside、um, the, the kind of cultural reading of the film. I think they go very nicely together, and we'll、uh, talk about the copy perhaps a little bit later on. But perhaps we could have your response、um, now. Great.、Um, so, since I'm sure you know, these are quite controversial and interesting films, I'll keep my response、uh, um, rather brief. But I just wanted to touch on a couple of、um, ra rather important points, I think, in、uh, Tarayama's work. The first of which is the concept of everything as theater, as everything turned into theater, a radical theatricalization, really, of everyday life. So, at first, you might not think that this as being particularly tied to something like. The 1920s、um, in places like the Soviet Union, but actually, I think there is quite an important tie to 
uh, filmmakers of the former Soviet Union who wanted a, a to rid film right of fictionality. But what actually Tereyan was doing by imposing fictionality on everyday life becomes a rather similar project where in this process of you know turning the everyday, turning the post office, and he has a, a quote about you know everything, the post office, the street, the, the grocery store, everything being turned into theater, it becomes actually a rather similar um, radicalization of everyday life experience and has rather parallel goals, I think, to this early period in film history. Another thing I wanted to touch upon is his desire to create a dialogue between the viewer and the filmmaker, and the viewer and the film. So this this endlessly porous space where there is, as you can, as you you know, everyone witnessed in, um, especially the the second and third films, this you know creation of a porous space between the the viewer and the filmmaker, and the ability of, of this very rare interpenetration, um, which was according to Tarayama, one of his main purposes for making art and specifically making films. Um, another point I wanted to talk about was that for Tarayama, the idea of play is quite serious, right? So his films are very playful and, is, and this is something that I think many people noticed. The first film is rather funny. There is a lot of laughter. There's a lot of you know, sort of playful, um, joking responses, but this is actually quite serious, right? So something that is very, very playful is simultaneously a very serious act. And you know, we can probably talk in the Q and A about what exactly, how it, you know, how it's serious and what he means by play and what is playful in Tarayama. But it's an important thing to think about. Um, something that he used to call his his um, what is called in English the sort of ceiling gallery, which he called his um, how he called his performance as um, performers. Um, can some in some is sometimes um, sort of subtitled the laboratory of play, which I think is rather interesting. You know, both play as theater and also play as a space of you know um, free aesthetic play or something that you can undergo as if you were a child engaging in a space like the cinema or the theater. Um, and just a couple of other notes. In the first film that we watched, I don't think it was an accident that the first few interviewees were, um, were black, because actually Tarayama sort of famously noted that he considered himself a black version of a Japanese man, which is rather strange and controversial in its own right, but he really thought of himself as participating in this um, sort of more, you know, um, sort of discriminated person because he came from Aomori, which is a, you know, from the north of Japan, and he was considered to have been rather large, and so he sort of thought of himself weirdly as a, as a black Japanese man. And so I don't think it's an accident uh, that, of course, it could all, it's just my thought that, that the first few interviewees that we see happen to be, um, happen to be black Americans. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is the idea that Tarayama had of theater being a crime. And he wanted this, right? For him, a theater, a theatrical experience has to somehow be criminal. And he really praised this about both cinema and the theater. And so it's, you know, in, it's, it was very common for him to get into a lot of trouble in his theatrical performances. But this is something he, he wanted, you know, his, it was it's his iconoclasm, his tendency for these sort of radical nihilistic acts that tended to, you know, get him into trouble, but also revealed, I think, something very profound about what he viewed filmmaking to be. So. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Mm. Alex. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, watching these um, films again, it uh, just reminded me of how far what Tarayama is doing goes beyond film or goes beyond maybe even a single, any of the single media that he was working in. Um, someone who is, who is now a very well-known uh, media professor of media studies in Japan was a graduate student in, in New York in the 1980s and was tasked with driving around uh, Nagisa Oshima, who's a, one of the best known uh, Japanese directors of the 60s and 70s, when he was visiting uh, New York for a retrospective. And he asked him, um, he told me this once, he asked him, well, who do you consider your greatest rival in the, in the world of Japanese film? 
Um, and he told me he's now very embarrassed about asking a question like that. But Oshima responded in saying, well, clearly that's Terayama Shuji. And um, I just couldn't compete in the end. Um, there was no way I could compete with Terayama. And at the time, this struck um, my acquaintance as very strange. Terayama is, is known as, as someone who worked in many, many different fields. But because of that, in some way, he's also not really known primarily as a film director or or so, so um, he, he just didn't understand why, uh, why would someone like Oshima, who's seen as one of the great masters of Japanese cinema, feel that he couldn't compete with, with Terayama. From, I think, watching something like this, and if you have a chance to see some of the films that are showing at the anthology film archives in the next few days, um, I think uh, you'll understand this, you, it'll make sense to you too. Um, it, it's partially because Terayama is going well beyond what Oshima can do. He's not trying to tell stories. He's not creating single works that um, convey a kind of narrative or even a kind of message of sorts. What he's doing is really going beyond something like he's, do, he's doing world building, and that's a very new uh, kind of strategy at that point in time. He's, he's creating a gigantic kaleidoscope going across different media, connected through different motifs, through themes, uh, through kind of narrative fragments um, that pop up again and again in different kind of variations. And through that, he, he sets the media against each other, creating these weird overlaps and tensions. Um, and, and those in that interplay, they create uh, a whole variety of new media. It's really a kaleidoscopic kind of strategy. Um, and uh, as, as Julia said, that extends beyond just kind of the world of, of the mediated, right? So this goes well, reaches into the everyday uh, and tries to utilize the everyday as kind of fragments of information and parts of, of what might become a work in a sense as well. Um, there's a very, very, one of the very famous examples of this is when Terayama helps to organize an actual funeral for a, a, a fictional character from a famous boxing, boxing manga called Tomorrow's Joe um, after that character dies in the manga. And several hundred people come to attend and this is big news <coughs> in the newspapers. Um, and the newspaper headlines are like, this is scary, this is weird. People are going to a funeral for a fictional character. Um, and uh, there are several other examples in the following years, so this becomes much more kind of less worthy of repor being reported upon in newspapers. But at the time, this was quite shocking. But it's two weeks after this funeral that the Japanese Red Army uh, hijacks the Yodogo airplane, uh, an air passenger airplane, uh, from Narita Airport and flies it to Pyongyang in North Korea. And they issue a manifesto as they do this. And the final sentence of the manifesto reads, we are tomorrow's Joe. So the, even the radical left is not um, quoting Marx or Lenin. They're referring to a manga, right? <laughs> uh, so something is changing significantly. And Terayama is someone who really has his finger on the pulse in this. And he's trying to utilize that, these changing sensibilities, the way we're constantly entangled with media the way we're not really, we can't be separated from them anymore. And he sees that as working, you know, for that he works across the entire spectrum. And um, the way that he kind of calls the audience to action to pick up the hammer without really telling you what it might mean to pick up the hammer, but first of all, pick it up and, and do something, right? Do, try to generate some kind of action uh, that leads to something. That's part of that larger project, I think. Thanks very much, Alex. And I, I very much appreciate the focus on action. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a strong interest of mine in relating the theatre to the, the milieu of the times. And, and that time and time again, you look at the records, whether it's the artistic practices or indeed the manifesto of student protest groups or radical protest groups. And there's this really repetitious focus on action action above anything else almost. It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the uber keyword of the period. So thank you very much. Um, I think that those comments are all very helpful in helping us understand something about, um, something more about the nature of this remarkable performance and, and films.
that we've seen. And I think it's now that a time that we'll go to the audience. And uh, uh, please, if you've got a question, please perhaps uh, indicate who you would like to answer it, because we've got rather a large panel here. So. Um, One just there. Yeah. And please keep your questions brief because we will have a reception. So, <laughs> uh, just a brief comment. I, I, I've been exploring experiential storytelling, and, and this is what really touched me. And I think I thought of uh, two quotes one by uh, Saul Bellows, which says, uh, We're so shock resistant, maybe the only thing that can touch us is poetry. And uh, th I see that as well as uh, a quote by uh, Peter Brook, which uh, says that this is our playground. Th and I, I, I get that feeling he's playing with us. And that one, my question is, what is uh, the sexual element in his time, in his culture? Because here we were founded by Puritans. What, I, I have no concept of the uh, Japanese sense of sexual uh, innuendo. Can you get anybody comment on that? Uh, uh, perhaps if we could just put it out there as a provocation and a question to think about. I'm, I'm sure we all have perspectives on that, but uh, would you like to say anything about that in particular? Or, or perhaps some other members of the panel? Uh, uh, the reason I'm hesitating is it's probably a very large question to answer and it's, uh, it would take quite a while. I think if I can just say that whatever sexual mores are, you know, if the question is about sexual mores in Japanese society, then Tarayama is clearly trying to go against the, the status quo, right? So I'm not sure if the, the films necessarily reveal what is the, the you know, average, you know, sexual experience of, of our nature of sexuality in Japan, but rather he's always trying to go um, towards a very, very uncomfortable location. For instance, um, in Emperor Tomato Ketchup, right, one of his most famous films that was also a long, uh, <laughs> has a long and short version, there's an infamous sequence with a uh, many prepubescent children appearing to, um, they're feigning sexual activity, but pretty much, ha you know, there is sexual activity with adults and even middle-aged people, and it's a re extremely controversial sequence, but you, know, you clearly can't look at that and make something up, you know, up about Japanese sexual mores because he's just going so far into the extreme of the opposite, right? So, so. We are in a context where a lot of artists are experimenting with, I guess, diff physicality in the body. And I think that that's also a very prominent experience for many artists of that particular generation. But there's also this very lively sense of play, but also fascination for particular repetitious actions, I think, is something that comes up again and again in many, not just Teriyama, but many of the other, uh, perhaps you could compare that to some of the Bhutto performances of the time, for example. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering uh, um, if uh, anybody could address uh, how Mr. Teriyama was seeing his work in relation to the work of uh, other directors in Europe and in America at the time. Uh, maybe if uh, Mr. Morisake could tell us if there was uh, any particular director outside of Japan that he admired or he spoke about. Uh, えっと、テレマ
at the time, he was interested in the Japanese director Shohei Imamura and Frederick Firini, and in terms of uh, performing arts cantor in Arabah, he had relations with them. あの、<笑><笑> あの、イタリアのかん、of the 60s generation, Teriyama was, was uh, popular in Europe. His work toured, where it was many of the other generation of artists at that time did not tour their work to Europe. Uh, Karajuro only toured in Asia. Um, Buto companies were later than Teriyama to ex ex go to the world. And so I think there was this, Teriyama was a very interesting case of a, of a Japanese avant-garde that uh, had some uh, relationship to European audiences. Mm. ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。ラマ。
no kabuki at the time, it was, which wasn't done in Japan, um, there is something that, there is a dropping performance that's usually swept away to the side, but by keeping that space open, he said, just drop it straight through. Um, so he changed the conventions of that performance entirely, is what that upset. Thank you. <coughs> This is a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much, all of you, for your comments. And uh, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. And uh, the, which I just happened to have the good fortune of meeting Mr. Terayama years ago. In fact, I saw the third film in 75 or 6 in California. It was shown there once um, at the University of the Pacific. And uh, uh, I got to know him a little bit. And I know that one thing he was trying to do, which is kind of alluded to by several of you, was almost, we could call it like meta theater or meta filmmaking. These things are about the making process itself, the creative process itself. And if there's any ultimate goal in there, he wanted people to question things. What is theater? That's those questions in the first one. Who am I? Who are you? What are you? These are really profound questions when you start thinking about them. And I think he wanted people to think about those sorts of things. And in a couple, one of his plays, he's got the characters controlled by puppets, uh, strings. And, and uh, after, as the play is dissolved and the, play, the, 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 the actors come out on stage and he just wants people to talk about that, you know, who's controlling these people? Uh, who's controlling you? And then, and, then, and then ultimately he says, and how do you believe any, anybody there? How can you even believe the playwright? Um, that's a really, I'm envious that you actually met Teddy Amashuchi, but uh, uh, it's a, a fantastic experience. And uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting comment. Um, I think the first thing I ever saw was uh, an essay that was published in TDR, which was the Tenjo Sajiki Manifesto of the time. And I'm sure some of you have seen this. The way that it was print printed was that, that it was intentionally illegible. So you had to read across light and dark sections of the page in order to put the sentences together. So there's constantly this uh, a kind of deferral of meaning, but also this invitation to come into this kind of meta-spectatorship, I guess, or meta-theatrical event. So it's a, it's a really fascinating comment that you've made, I think. So thank you. Yes, <laughs> He, he was wearing a turtleneck. Oh. Is it a a cut oh, he was, oh, he uh, had a pet turtle. I'm sorry. The Hitotsuno Namaega Kotae, Hitotsuno Namaega Question, ah, Shimon Desta. One turtle was named Question and the other was named Answer. So, the Dotino Kamega Oki Katakato Yuto. And in terms of which turtle was larger, it was the question turtle. When I asked him why, he said there are many answers inside of question. So the Teremono no Kosta Kotobana and the Sega, what I shiva Idaina Ningen Niva Naritakua Naides. Um, these are Terayama's words. I don't want to become a large person. I want to become a large, large question mark. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Some, sometimes you have the perfect end to a symposium, and I think we just had it there. So always think to the big turtle. Um, uh, but just before we go tonight, and we are going to have a reception, I'd just like to thank one or two people. Frank also mentioned uh, so many of the people who put this event together, uh, the very uh, many organisations that have sponsored this event. And once again, um, so thank you to the Harvard Film Archive, the Anthology Film Archives, the George Easton Museum, the Japan Foundation, the National Film Center, the National Museum of Modern Art, and the generous support of the Kinoshita Group. Uh, we also thank Go Hirasawa and Julian Ross, both of whom couldn't be here, but it was actually Go-san who came to us first and said, hey, we're having this film exhibition in town, do you want to do this component of it? And uh, 
And we immediately, well, actually, Frank immediately <laughs> said yes. And uh, so uh, yeah. um, the next group of people I need to thank, uh, uh, thank uh, Frank and uh, the Siegel Centre because uh, Frank and his staff really do the impossible sometimes. They're a small public programs organisation, a part of the Graduate Centre of the City of University of New York, very much attached to the PhD program in theatre, but uh, uh, you know, they're, they're basically they are Frank and the staff you see here tonight and all of the people who've really put this together. So thank you, Frank, and <laughs> thank you to all. <laughs> and thank you to, to, for, to everybody for coming out tonight. Please join us for a yeah. short uh, celebration, and short compo. And to, mm. to uh, remark on your call to action, maybe if you want, Nine of the hammers are up for grabs, so you can take them <laughs> home and continue uh, hammering. One we're going to keep here at the Seagull, and uh, we're going to have a reception here, not for too long, 10, 15 minutes, and then walk over to the archive bar, which is on 36th between 5th and Madison. It's in your program, and hope you can join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.